Good afternoon. Can I get your attention, please? Well, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here to Des Moines University. I'm Angela Franklin, the president and CEO of Des Moines University, and it's a pleasure to have all of you with us here for our healthy discussions. Of course, for those who might not know and be familiar with our university, we have a 114-year history of being a health sciences university. We actually, in the last year, have recalibrated our mission and redefined ourselves in terms of establishing our way forward for the future by designating our mission very boldly as a mission to improve lives in our global community by educating a very diverse, highly competent, and compassionate group of health care providers for the future. So we're so pleased that you have joined us here. Um, we are also equally pleased to be partnering with the Partnership for Better Health. Now, of course, this is a network of health care organizations, providers, advocates, and consumers de dedicated to lowering the cost of health care through prevention, intervention, and innovation. Now, the Partnerships for Better Health works to educate the public, inform policymakers, and engage political candidates, as we are today, um, about the need to invest in health to save um, health care um, for the future citizens of, of not just this community, but the country and, and ultimately the world. So we are one of the partner organizations, and we're so pleased to have you with us as we begin our first with Senator Grassley here today. What I will do next is introduce one of our partners in, in this, the co-director of the Partnerships for Better Health, Mr. Christopher Atkinson. He is the director of the State Hygienic Laboratory, associate dean for public health practice, and the clinical professor in health management and policy at the College of Public Health at the University of Iowa. Mr. Atkinson serves on a number of state boards, including the prevention of Disabilities Policy Council, the Medical Home Advisory Council, and is also chair of the Safety Net Advisory Council. He is a past chair of the Des Moines-based Child and Family Policy Center and is co-chair of Iowa's Partnership for Better Health. At the national level, Mr. Atkinson has served as president of the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials during the years 1994 and 95 and was chair of the Joint Council of Official Health Agencies. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. Christopher Atkinson, who is now going to introduce our speaker for today, Senator Grassley. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Franklin, President Franklin, uh, for hosting uh, the partnership uh, here at Des Moines University. Um, it's uh, really a pleasure for us to, uh, to come together as a, uh, a community uh, within the partnership and, and uh, join with you for this event. This is the, the first in a series of bipartisan uh, political forums that uh, the Partnership for Better Health uh, is going to host over the next uh, month or so. Uh, and it provides an opportunity uh, for us to have dialogue uh, with our uh, federal uh, uh, officials, uh, both to uh, uh, get input on what Congress is uh, thinking, but also, uh, I hope, uh, and I know this group fairly well, uh, to provide some comments uh, for them as well. So thank you very much, uh, President Franklin, for hosting this. Uh, as uh, President Franklin said, uh, the Partnership for Better Health uh, is an organization now of about uh, 60 organizations. Uh, uh, we've been growing literally uh, on a, uh, a weekly basis uh, uh, recently. Uh, the purpose of the partnership, as those of you in the room probably know, uh, is to encourage uh, the triple uh, purpose of prevention, intervention, and innovation in our discussions about health care. Uh, simple access isn't enough. Indeed, we do need uh, that kind of uh, uh, comprehensive uh, system. So we try to engage in dialogue and give the evidence uh, that suggests why that is the best approach. Uh, the partnership does not uh, support or oppose individual candidates or political parties in any way or advocate for any specific legislation. Our purpose is to educate and inform. Now I have the pleasure to introduce Iowa's distinguished Senator Charles Grassley, who I will parenthetically note is accompanied by his equally charming and well-respected wife, Barbara. Barbara, right here. 
Senator Grassley has served the United States Senate since 1980. Prior to that, he was a member of the U.S. House of Representatives beginning in 1974. Uh, he started his political career in the Iowa legislature. As senator, he serves as the ranking member of the Judiciary Committee, as well as the Finance, Budget, Agriculture, and Joint Tax Committees. Senator Grassley has continued to be an advocate and spokesman for Iowa and maintains his connection with everyday citizens by holding a meeting in each Iowa county annually. He also holds the longest record for not missing a vote of any senator in office. In regards to health care, Senator Grassley authored the Senate bill that created the Medicare Prescription Drug Benefit, bringing the program up to date with the practice of medicine and better enabling treatment outside of hospital stays. Additionally, as ranking member of the Finance Committee during the health care reform debate, Senator Grassley uh, became intimately and remains in intimately aware of health reform in the nation. On a personal note, Senator Grassley has been no stranger to the partnership. He has met with many of our partner organizations in the past and has always had an open ear for our concerns. He has run with the triple solution message and has worked very hard to ensure that it is implemented at the federal level and understood locally. Uh, with no further ado, my pleasure to introduce Senator Charles Grassley. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction, uh, also to President Franklin for the hospitality. And I'm glad to know that I'm the first one here, but uh, they invited me three months ago, so I thought I might be the last one. And, and sometimes I'm never able to fulfill those uh, invites either. So I'm glad that I can do both and glad to inaug uh, inaugurate it and uh, glad to have so many other people that are scheduled to follow on because with the rising cost of health care uh, and particularly the problems we have in the delivery of health care in rural America, <clears throat> there's uh, really nothing more important. Uh, I, I think also uh, I should mention that I've known Chris a long time before he was a professor. Uh, in his uh, role as head of the Department of Health here in the state of Iowa. Uh, he helped me uh, inaugurate a nonprofit organization that I started called Face It Together, an anti-drug program, and I want to thank him again for uh, that help, and he put a lot of time into that as well. And, of course, uh, he's already talked about the partnership for better health, but I also thank not only uh, Des Moines University, but that partnership uh, for their hospitality, but more importantly, for the efforts to do the things that are called for that uh, Chris already mentioned, uh, lowering the cost of health care uh, through prevention, intervention, and innovation. I know a large part of your mission is to educate policymakers about the need to focus on these areas. Uh, th of course, that's right in line with what we ought to be thinking about as a nation, but also in line with my philosophy and that representative government's a two-way street. Uh, and a forum like this is a perfect opportunity to make representative government work. I'm one half of that process, you're the other half, and it mandates that we have dialogue. So uh, the, the, the policy that I'm going to express here is more or less just an update. Uh, but, uh, you know, there might be 75 people here, and you've got 75 different approaches. So the way I kind of respond to representative government is to let you set the agenda. So after I'm uh, done presenting what I was asked to present, uh, then it's your opportunity to uh, ask questions. If you even want to ask personal questions, that's okay with me. I presume you want most of the questions to be on health care reform, but if somebody asks us something else and President Franklin says you can't answer that question, uh, that's only the time I wouldn't answer. Uh, another thing to remind you, if you just want to present a statement to me, I'll be glad to listen. And lastly, uh, if you ask a question, you know, we people in political life have a point of always talking around an issue. I want to answer your question, and sometimes I misinterpret your question, and if I've misinterpreted it, make sure that you tell me what you really asked me so I can answer your question. Uh, and this will just be maybe seven or eight minutes, and then you'll ask questions. For the last two years, America has experienced an unprecedented period of uncertainty in health care. And I think at least for the next couple years, maybe longer, it's going to still be some uncertainty. 
Uh, we now have a very massive law of 2,700 pages called the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act of, two, of 2010, uh, also sometimes known just as the Affordable Care Act and sometimes uh, known as Obamacare. It makes sweeping changes to our health care system that touch vir virtually every sector of health care. Um, and if you've read those 2,700 pages and you think you know exactly what's coming, let me remind you that there's 1,693 delegations of authority to the Secretary to write regulations, and you're going to have to read them to fully understand it. And I doubt if they've uh, done that they have done more than a few dozen, and those few dozen have already added up to 12,000 pages of regulations. So you've got your work ahead of you as you think about that. Um, and, of course, uh, from a political standpoint now, not a constitutional standpoint, the future of that law remains in question. The constitutionality of the law was first uncertain, uh, uh, and that uncertainty has now been addressed. The Supreme Court has ruled, and we know now that the law as a whole is constitutional. The individual mandate uh, as a spending power or Commerce Committee power is not constitutional, but the individual mandate as a taxing under the taxing authority of Congress is constitutional. The mandatory expansion of Medicaid program is not constitutional, uh, according to the court. And while I would have preferred a different outcome from the court, I have to, based upon taking an oath to uphold the Constitution, respect the court's opinion. So now implementation of the, uh, of the uh, entire law uh, moves, uh, moves forward. Uh, uh, now as the implementation of the act can move forward, but states as part of the Medicaid uh, administering uh, have a choice now under that provision that was declared unconstitutional of whether to expand the Medicaid programs in their respective states. The uncertainty of where health care policy is going continues. The Congressional Budget Office, and to me that's like God in Washington, D.C., because if they say something costs something, you think, well, they're just people. They say it costs something. Maybe it doesn't really cost that. But if Congress wants to exceed whatever they say something's going to cost, and somebody raises a budget point of order against it, you have to have 60 votes to override it. And that makes the Congressional Budget Office God, because you hardly ever get 60 votes to override anything in Washington at all. So when the Congressional Budget Office says something, you can say it's wrong, you can disagree with it, but unless you've got 60 votes to override it, uh, God has spoken. Uh, now, they, uh, they estimate, as far as Medicaid is concerned, that one in six individuals that were eligible under that provision of health care reform, uh, the Medicaid expansion, will reside in states that choose not to maybe expand their Medicaid numbers. The clear majority of states are far from ready to implement the health care insurance exchanges that are created under law, and so that's another uncertainty. Coverage through uh, the private sector and through Medicaid is supposed to begin January 1st, 2014, and I've heard nobody say it needs to be delayed, but maybe you get to a point where somebody between now and then may see it needs to be delayed. And it seems highly unlikely that all states will be ready uh, to, uh, to f facilitate their operation of the exchange uh, by that day. So then, of course, as you know, the law says, the federal government comes in and does it. The next major uncertainty is political, though, uh, and that relates directly to what's going to happen in the next 90 or so days. Uh, clearly, the two presidential candidates have very different positions on the Affordable Care Act. As you know, if uh, President uh, Obama is reelected, the act will go on pretty much as uh, anticipated 
there might be some changes that somebody's going to suggest needs to be made, not from a philosophical point of view. It'll be what we call tweaking, you know, something that relates to something that isn't going to quite work the way we thought it was going to work. But that's a fact. If, uh, whether you like this law or not, if President Obama's reelected, it's going to stay in place. Uh, if Governor Romney wins, uh, he's running on a platform of repeal. Uh, and uh, he said even before repeal, on the first day, he would do what he could to halt the implementation. I believe as a practical matter, that means he's going to give waivers to as many states as want the waivers uh, so they can operate a program under that provision of the law. But uh, it could mean other things as well. But if you ask me what those other things are, I'm not sure that I can tell you. But he, uh, he wants to uh, work for Congress to repeal. Uh, and replace, replace the law. Now, that replacement is very, very important because if I didn't say replace or any other member of Congress talked to you about replace, then we would be saying to you that everything about the health care system as we know it today, both government and non-government, uh, is okay. And I don't think there's any of you in this room are prepared to say that the status quo is okay. Uh, but if, if that's what you said, uh, then I think uh, you're wrong, because I don't believe that. Now, what you do to replace it is, uh, as a practical matter, a lot of things that are in the health care reform bill that I helped write even though I voted against it, uh, you know, I think those things probably ought to stay. But I think, uh, uh, you know, you're going to have a political consensus of what that is, and I'll uh, give you a little more details if you ask questions about that. Uh, but... When this comes to repeal, since I voted against it, and since there was a vote uh, January, February, March sometime of 2011, and I voted to repeal, I'd be intellectually dishonest if I didn't also vote uh, to repeal and replace, and I do support that aspect. But if uh, Governor Romney's not elected, that's not even an issue. Um, but if we come to repeal, then things are going to take its place. So I think it needs to be more of a consensus piece of legislation. And I say that because I think uh, after nine months of negotiating on health care reform uh, from January to September of 2011, three Republicans and three Democrats trying to come up with a bipartisan issue, in September the President decided it was taking too long to do that. We're going to go ahead politically. So it was a very partisan bill. Uh, uh, in, the, in the entire Congress, except for one lonely Republican in the House of Representatives, every Republican voted against it. Now, let me give you a historical basis for what I say about being a big mistake. Because uh, I, I suppose you'd say social policy started, uh, at least affecting the entire nation, with Social Security, and then 30 years later with Medicare and Medicaid, and in that same 30-year period of time, all the civil rights laws, and maybe you can name a few other that have established sweeping policy change in America. Remember, all of these that I mentioned before the Affordable Health Care Act passed were done with broad bipartisan support. So I guess in saying that, if you ever hear any Democrats say, well, Republicans never like uh, civil rights laws, well, they were written in a Democratic-dominated United States Senate in the office of the Republican leader because at that particular time there were so many Democrats in the Senate from the South that they didn't want to give civil rights. It had to be bipartisan or we wouldn't have civil rights laws today. So I think it was a mistake for, this, for the President to go partisan. And that's why this is such a political issue today. But it's also why there's a lot of questions to be raised about it that wouldn't have been raised if they had followed the route of, of Senator Bingaman, Senator Baucus, Senator Conrad, Senator Grassley, Senator Enzi, and Senator Snow, those of us that spent nine months, our, I don't know how many hundreds of hours, uh, going over trying to develop one. Uh, so repeal is a real possibility for reasons that were mistakes that were made two years ago. Uh, if we have it, it needs to be consensus. That's where I left off when I went off on my tirade. Uh, we, should we should address the number of Americans who are underinsured and have no health insurance. Now, some of this is being done in the marketplace from this standpoint. Prior 
to the Supreme Court ruling it constitutional with the supposition it was going to be uh, uh, ruled unconstitutional, a lot of big health insurance companies said, at least in two areas, and maybe in more areas, but I only remember two, that when it comes to pre-existing conditions and keeping kids on the family health insurance uh, until they're 26 years of age, several companies said they were going to continue to do that. So now maybe the marketplace has already made a decision. That's a smart policy. But let's suppose just on one of those two things. We all know that it's difficult for some people because of pre-existing conditions to get health insurance. So if we don't have the individual mandate, which is the most sweeping thing, because for the first time in the history of this country, the federal government says you have to do something that maybe you don't want to do. Before that, most regulation was based on the proposition that if you're involved in commerce, we can regulate the commerce, but you choose to be involved. But if you choose not to be involved, at least from the point of the federal government, being a government of limited powers, unlike states that have unlimited powers except what's prohibited in the federal constitution, you know, this is the first time the federal government's ever done that. So that's pretty sweeping. Uh, but if, if, uh, if you have pre-existing conditions, then what we're going to have to do is very dramatically brief up the risk, uh, beef up the risk, ri ri what am I saying? The risk pools that states have, see. So that's one, uh, just one idea. Um, the very real health care problems in our country must receive attention, but the new health care law as I've indicated to you, create a whole set of new problems that probably wouldn't have been there if we'd had a bipartisan approach. So, obviously, I believe we can do better, and a lot of you probably are supportive of this legislation, and you feel we can't do any better. That's an honest difference of opinion. Regardless of the outcome of the election, and apart from the health care law, we will still need to address health care entitlements. That's Medicare Medicaid. Americans' national debt is approaching $16 trillion. Over the next decade, the federal government will spend $11 trillion on Medicare and Medicaid. Re reform of our two health care entitlements are not an option. And let me uh, broaden that just a little bit. Uh, it, it, let's see. Let's suppose you say, just leave my Medicare alone or just leave my Medicaid alone, or just leave my Social Security alone. And that's what people that come to my town meeting say. I have to say to them, well, if we just leave your Medicaid alone, Medicare alone, I should have said Medicare, then that means that after 2024, there isn't going to be any Medicare. Well, we want to keep Medicare as it's a part now after 45 years, 50 years, as part of the social fabric of America. Uh, it's very important. So you got to do something. But if you do nothing, it goes away. Or if you just want to keep it where it is by, uh, by uh, borrowing money or raising taxes or reducing benefits, what you know is that by 2050, three programs, Medicaid, Medicare, and Social Security, they're 100 percent of the federal budget means you have no national defense, you have no education, you have no FBI, you have no this or that. That's the trend we're on. So if somebody says you don't really have to do anything about it, you know, then the federal government becomes a fiscal agent for everybody else. Put money in this pocket, take it out of this pocket. There's no decisions made. The entitlement law has made all the decisions. You just pay the bill. So it's runaway. And something has to be done about it. And the sooner we do something about it, the easier it's going to be. And it's already a very difficult issue. It was already a difficult issue in 2005 when I tried to work for seven or eight months to do something about Social Security. And when we got done in the seven, eight months, didn't get anything done, I know that the opposition had beat us before we ever started. But if we'd taken care of Social Security then, instead of being a, a 13 or $14 trillion problem, it probably would have been a 7 or $8 trillion problem. Uh, I'm going to skip some things here because of my tirade. 
uh, currently, as an example of, uh, of improving the quality of care, health care entities are forming accountable care organizations to, gam to examine new payment models to emphasize coordinated care. The development of these models to provide more efficient care is important. We have a few tools otherwise to contain costs besides cutting benefits to providers or asking more from beneficiaries. Uh, it is a time of uncertainty out there in all of these areas we've been discussing, but we're going to be moving forward in the future no matter what the outcome, and I strongly encourage you to stay engaged uh, in this uh, issue with your government in the process of representative government, whether it's me or whether it's uh, uh, any of the other people, Republican or Democrat, they're going to appear before you. And don't wait for them to appear before you. Make sure that, uh, that you are aggressive in giving them your opinions. Uh, in implementing the Affordable Care Act or its successor or reforming Medicaid care or, and Medicaid, the government will continue to make a, a lot of decisions, and maybe some of you would say, as I would, too many decisions in health care. Congress and the federal agencies need to hear from all sectors of the health care system on how actions in Washington affect patients, doctors, hospitals, employees, uh, and beyond, and uh, employers as well. Uh, Washington uh, is, well, this is, uh, this is not meant to be a joke. There's reality to it. Uh, Washington is an island surrounded by reality. So a dose of reality needs to make its way onto that island for our government to serve the people the way it should serve. And this uh, Q&A we're going to start right now uh, is a good way to start it, and I hope you continue it up when it's done. Who wants to be the first to ask a question? Yes. The, the first part of your question is a political answer, and uh, it's not an answer that I necessarily uh, agree with, but I think it's just a practical answer. I think if you're running on a platform, well, it's because people are so cynical about government is where I'm starting from. You run on a platform or repeal, and let's suppose I just got done saying there's a lot of this 2,700 pages that even some of it I helped write that are probably going to be retained. But the, pre the problem you get into is if you run on a platform or repeal and, you're, and, you, and you start messing with what you got there, it's, it's a pretty murky picture of exactly what, how the electorate might read whether or not you're keeping your promise to the people. So that's why I say two words, uh, repeal and replace. The replacement would be some of those parts that are maybe still in it. And let me say, I talked about bipartisanship and partisanship. But a lot of these things are not, they're just common sense. They would pass by consensus. And the only reason they're in a very controversial bill is some of us have been working on them for five or six years, and it was a place to put them uh, because you knew the bill was going to pass, or at least uh, you th originally it was going to be a bipartisan bill. Uh, and and, and it, it got in there. So they're really by consensus, accountable Care organizations is an example. Every emphasis upon pre-existing conditions. Uh, you know, there ought to be five or six I can name right now, but you, give you those two examples of things that would, would be put in there. Uh, next, next question. Uh, yes, sir. Hi, my name is Doug Chu. I'm from the American Heart Association. I'm a volunteer, and uh, I also have a heart disease survivor. I want to take just a second to thank Senator Grass. Washington, D.C. on behalf of the National Institute of Health and American Heart Association and 
June, and you were considerate enough to take the time to hear myself and the research professor that we had as we advocated to uh, try to protect the National Institute of Health funding uh, from the sequester or the automatic uh, cuts that are coming at the end of the year. We pointed out that there was a, uh, over $200 million comes uh, from the National Institute of Health uh, to Iowa, to, and that translates into 4,000 jobs, well-paying jobs, and uh, so obviously those were points we felt were bipartisan and we could uh, speak on it. Wondered how you felt you were going to be able to help us to protect that, that National Institute of Health yeah, yeah. funding that's coming in and the jobs yeah, yeah. that we have from it. Uh, I'd like to put your question in the context other than affordable health care, because sequestration, it, you, I don't question your impact on, on health care in, in the areas particularly, whether it's research or whether it's actually, uh, you know, um, med Medicare being cut a certain small percentage. It's going to be, have to be dealt with separately and will be dealt with, and uh, I... I uh, and it's going to be dealt with, not because of domestic programs, but because if you take six, uh, uh, about almost, let's say almost one half of the one and two tenths trillion dollars out of defense, you're going to end up with a hollow defense. So that's going to, uh, uh, that's going to uh, uh, be the emphasis that reforms everything of a decision that was made August the 2nd 2011, a year ago, see, and that was because the super committee was supposed to work, and this uh, sequestration was put in place just in case they didn't function, and they didn't function. So you have this one and two tenths trillion dollar cuts going into effect uh, January 1st, 2013, and that one and two tenths trillion figure is is a 10 year figure because the Congressional Budget Law Office. Under law, always has to look ahead 10 years. So let's say uh, uh, 120 billion, maybe in the first year there. That's a massive amount. And uh, so I think there's two answers to your question. One, if President Obama is reelected, it may be solved in November and December, and tied up with uh, tax policies that are coming up at the same period of time, and maybe some sort of a uh, compromise between Republicans and Democrats, uh, one party accepting some tax increases and the other one accepting some, some adjustments over in the sequestration. And uh, uh, I could be involved with that, but it, sometimes that's done at the leadership level. That means McConnell and Reid and Boehner and, and uh, Democrat, uh, Pelosi, you know. Sometimes it's done at the committee level, then I would be involved as a member of the Finance Committee. But also Senator Harkin would be very much involved, too, because under his committee is the jurisdiction of everything in the National Institute of Health, see, and also under his chairmanship of the subcommittee that handles that area as well, see. So uh, then if, if, president, if uh, Governor Romney's elected president, I think all of this stuff, including taxes and sequestrations, going to be put off into next year, maybe June the 1st, so a new president can get established uh, and have his own program that he wants to present to Congress. See. Okay, next question. Yeah. Thank you, Senator Grassley, for coming. Um, to speak a little bit about sequestration in the academic realm, there's a real threat that this sequestration is going to reduce Medicare funding, thus reducing the funding for graduate medical education. Um, there is a hot topic now about privatizing the funding for graduate medical education, and I just wanted to know your views on that and if that's something that you favor um, for medical students at this time. Okay. How, how is the privatizing going to be funded? If you, if you don't have these federal dollars going into it, I don't understand how it's going to be. You mean a tax on Blue Cross as an example? Or insurance companies or um, no. big pharma companies. Um, funding the graduate medical yeah. education. I think I want everybody in the United States to fund a, a, a graduate education. Yeah. Okay, next question. Yes. Are you really?
No, still can't hear. Can you hear now? Okay. One of the things I do believe is certain is that Iowa has the highest quality care, medical care, and we are paid one of the lowest in the country, as you know, and you've been very supportive of trying to fix that. But as we go forward, we're still going to have the uninsured because the younger people, many that I've talked to, are going to take the tax penalty. They don't pay much taxes anyway, and they don't care. The Polk County Medical Society, which represents central Iowa counties and doctors, we provided over the last three years about $7 million worth of donated free specialty care by doctors and hospitals who don't even get paid fairly. So what I want to know is do you believe that with a new president they would be able to do a better job of trying to fix this, or do you think no matter who wins the election, we will still have a challenge to try and pay doctors fairly? Well, she, she pointed out one thing. Uh, uh, half of it's easy to answer. If you proceed with, with uh, the Affordable Care Act, then what she's pointing out here is that the penalty for not buying health insurance, particularly among young people, it's going to be like uh, a gamble. I'm not going to get sick, uh, and uh, I'm going to pay the, the penalty because the penalty is cheaper than what my health care insurance would cost me. Uh, and uh, and co consequently, then, when the doctor says you got cancer, then they'll buy the health insurance at that particular time. Uh, so it's kind of like a lottery, let's say. So that's one of the shortcomings of the Health Care Reform Act. But this is something that we debated nine months in our bipartisan negotiation. What, where is the point where it's going to be so, so punitive you're going to have a revolt against the individual mandate? And where is it going to be so low that people are going to play the lottery? And I don't know what the answer is, but that, that is definitely a shortcoming of the Affordable Care Act. In other words, shortcoming not to accomplish the goals that they wanted, the voluntary participation in the system, to be in the system, to have more people covered, to have more people under the umbrella. So health insurance was cheaper for everybody. Uh, the other part of it is uh, uh, very difficult to answer, but I think that it comes in two areas. Will your state take up voluntarily the additional people of Medicaid? And then that, that takes care of, in Iowa, would take care of 75,000 people right now, see. Uh, and, uh, but let me say this. A lot of states are reluctant to do that because the federal government doesn't keep its word very well that they're going to fund something at, at first of all, 100%. And then later on, for a few more years at 95 percent, but with one and six tenths trillion dollar deficit and going, uh, growing about a trillion dollars, and even if you elect, elect a Republican president, it's going to grow for a few years for quite a bit. Uh, and even if Obama's reelected, it's going to grow maybe, maybe a little bit more. But the point is that, uh, that do, do, a governor of state and a legislature of state, are you going to believe that the federal government is going to keep up with the terrible budget situation they have, fiscal situation they have, the promises that they made in 2009? You know, when you get down there beyond 2018, when the 100 percent and the 95 percent runs out. Uh, so then you get back to the, well, Medicaid is, is part of it, and the other one is the risk pool. It's about all you can do. Uh, well, there are other things. Uh, that, that I shouldn't have stopped at that, saying that's about all you can do because you surely could uh, give refundable credits uh, to uh, people to buy health insurance. See, and that and that's a uh, that has some bipartisan uh, support. Okay, next question. Hi. Oh, is it on? It's on. Hello. I think you got to put it close to your okay, mouth. Okay, sorry. I just wanted to follow up a little bit with Tara's question. Um, if privatization of graduate medical funding is not the answer, but there are cuts to it, um, where can that be? Where can we make up for that? Because without that funding, well, our med medical education is incomplete, yeah. and the physician shortfall will continue to grow. Okay. Well, it, sometimes, if you want to, if you want to look at the whole pool of money, as uh, as will it be cut back, whether it's larger, smaller, or right where it is, 
a major issue for us in the Midwest is most of the money, well, I shouldn't say most of the money, but a good share of the money and vast majority of the money goes to Massachusetts, New York, uh, you know, probably Texas, California. We get a very, about 12 states get the vast majority of the money, and a lot of us see it as a redistribution of the money, or if, if there's a cutback, not hurting us in rural areas because the states that get so much already maybe get more than what they're entitled to because of the political uh, power that those states have, particularly in the House of Representatives. Okay. Okay. Next question. Senator. Tony Lays from the Register. On the Medicaid issue, what do you recommend Iowa do? Do you recommend that the state oh. turn away the Medicaid money? I mean, it's hundreds of millions of dollars for hospitals yeah. and doctors. Uh, I, I'm going to leave it to people that know more about the fiscal conditions of the state of Iowa, uh, which means your legislature and the governor to make that decision. And I think I learned a lesson from ethanol when the, when the state legislature was going to pass a mandate for ethanol. I thought, boy, I'm the, I'm the defender of ethanol in Washington, D.C. Surely they aren't going to embarrass me at the Iowa legislature by not having a mandate for ethanol in Iowa. And so I was invited to the, uh, to the state senate caucus to convince them of that and you know they basically said why don't you go back to Washington you got enough problems take care of them back there we'll take care of this here okay next question yeah I'm interested if you could share your th oh she wants you to hold it closer okay sorry is this better um, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on um, Mr. Paul Ryan's plan to cut Medicare spending and to follow that, do you feel that it relies too heavily on the competition of the private sector to drive costs down? Uh, what I've, uh, let me answer your question two ways. One, about the whole principle of private sector driving health care costs down. I think with the proper incentives that, that, that there's enough evidence that that works. Uh, Safeway, you know, there's probably hundreds of examples I could give. Well, I, uh, I was only going to give one. I've, I've thought of two or three. Uh, one, Safeway. Safeway decided that we can't continue to have this increase in our health care costs. So they said, you know, we're going to give our employees $2,000 based upon what their health, healthy lifestyle. You know, and I don't know exactly what it was, but examples would be that if you've got a perfect healthy lifestyle and the right amount of weight, you're going to get $2,000. And if you smoke, you're only going to get 1500 And if you're obese and smoke, you might only get $1,000. But whatever amount of money they got. And then they had, uh, so you got this money put in your health care account, and you had to spend this amount of money first. And, uh, and, uh, and then if you spent over that amount of money, a catastrophic health care plan kicked in that they, that they paid for. You didn't, I don't think you had to pay for that. Then uh, they found that people started shopping for health care. And they found out that some, uh, you know, sort of test you take for your colon, and I can't ever pronounce it, but, you know, you know some places they charge $1,500 and some places $700. And so people started going where it was $700 to 15 Anyway, Safeway leveled off there. So there's a lot of private incentives you can put in to drive down health care costs. Another one is people that have health savings accounts generally have only about uh, 60, uh, they, uh, 60 to 70 percent less expenditures on health care than if you have third-party pay, as an example. And then there's an... Uh, there's, well, though, I'll just stop with those two examples. Now, your other question was what? Uh, I'll repeat it. What? Well, yeah, that, that one I just answered. Oh, yeah. Uh, understand, when a, chair, when, a chair, when a budget committee puts out a budget, this budget is nothing more than a broad outline. By the way, a budget never becomes law. 
So whatever Paul Ryan put out, even if it was adopted by Congress, it's never going to go to the president for signature. The Appropriations Committee, uh, the Appropriations is what is the authority to spend money, or an authorizing committee commission setting up a program. Like if the Paul Ryan budget went through, our Senate Finance Committee would flesh out something within the broad outline of what he wants to spend. Now, they don't just put dollar figures in a budget. And that, that's where everybody that's chairman of a budget committee is kind of stupid. They say we're going to save, we ought to save X number of dollars on Medicare, and they ought to stop there and leave it up to the finance committee to decide how that money is going to be saved. But every budget committee has got to put in what they call, quote, unquote, assumptions. So he puts in a whole bunch of assumptions that are along the lines of your question, say, uh, that, uh, that's going to dictate radical reform of Medicaid and all, Medicare and all that stuff. Well, his budget doesn't make that decision. His budget suggests that. The Senate Finance Committee and the House Ways and Means Committee is going to decide how to implement that. See? So, uh, budget doesn't become law. Now, I think the only answer to your question I gave when I was up there on the podium, if you say to me, as a lot of seniors do, just leave my Medicare alone, I'm satisfied with it. Yeah, you can just leave Medicare alone and... Uh, and 2024, there's not going to be any hospital medication, uh, any hospitalization coverage. There isn't any more money in the trust fund. Now, that's not my saying that. Every April or May, the tr trustees of the Social Security Medicare system look ahead 75 years, try to project, you know, the life of these programs and the shortcomings and shortfalls, et cetera. And that's what they say, not what Chuck Grassley says. So we know that. So Medicare, Medicare is part of the social fabric of America. It, it, there may be a lot wrong with it, but it's part of the social fabric of America. It's got to be maintained somewhere, okay? Now, what he's suggesting is simple. Maybe you've worked all your life and had Aetna health, health insurance all your life. And maybe you'd like to keep it in retirement you'd have the ability to keep it in retirement with, uh, with uh, the federal government paying uh, the, the premium. And you could have a lesser coverage if you wanted to or a higher coverage. If you have a higher coverage, then maybe you pay something. If you have a lower coverage, you don't pay anything. But with 44 million Americans in our society and with, 20, uh, with, with about, four, well, maybe it's 15 or 16 percent today, choosing Medicare Advantage, so you already got 20% of the senior citizen population wants something other than traditional Medicare. But let's suppose that Ryan wrote this, and it went through just the way he thought it ought to go through. He has joined Senator Wyden in a bipartisan bill that kind of compromises the original uh, the original uh, uh, proposal that he had in his budget a year ago, so that if you're a senior, you want to keep traditional Medicare, you can keep it. But he's got, he's got other options in there that are going to be available. And so you got to think, does the federal government always know exactly what all 44 million seniors want and 77 million people uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, that are baby boomers going into retirement? Do we know the needs of every one of them? And maybe uh, the traditional Medicare, as 20% of the seniors or 15 or 16% of the seniors already decided, they want Medicare Advantage, not just traditional Medicare. Maybe you ought to give more choice to more people because maybe the federal government doesn't know what's best for everybody. But it's a decision you're going to make as an individual, not Chuck Grassley making for you. Yeah, my so, wife is more political than I am. The, bu the Senate hasn't had a budget for three years. Because even though the law requires you have a budget for three years, because Reed runs the Senate like he wants to reelect 23 Democrats so he can stay in the majority uh, and, uh, and uh, be majority leader. And he doesn't want a tough votes that come when you have a budget. Even though he takes an oath to uphold the law, 
And the law says you have to have a budget, but I've talked too long. That's why you're up there. <laughs> it, it's it's the, the, the room prompt. Senator, thank you very, very much. Let's give Senator the rest of you. I want to thank everybody for attending today's uh, uh, discussion. We hope you found it informative. Uh, we have two uh, healthy discussions scheduled for just next week, uh, a real central Iowa uh, match uh, with uh, uh, Congressman Tom Latham on August 20th at 3 p.m. Uh, and Congressman Leonard Boswell at noon uh, here with uh, President Franklin's uh, blessings again in the Des Moines University Education Center. Uh, we hope you'll be able to join us for these events. Uh, in the coming weeks, uh, we'll be announcing additional events with the rest of the delegation, and we hope uh, the presidential uh, representatives as well. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you again, President Franklin.